So welcome all to our final talk from the interdisciplinary summer talks organized by the BOKU alumni group from the wildlife ecology and wildlife management group. Um, today we have um, a special guest, uh, the ecologist Dr. Dries Kuiper from the Polish um, Mammalian Research Institute. And uh, he will talk about how to keep the wolf from the door. And I will give the floor to him now. Thanks for joining in. You see here is a little bit of a wintry pitch, picture from the village of Białowieża, where also our institute, the Memo Research Institute is uh, situated. I'm working there now since what is it, 12 years uh, and currently as an associate professor. There's a picture that was, that was taken by my PhD student, Tom Dissidents, and it pretty much illustrates what this story will be about. The Biovieja village is in the heart of the uh, primeval forest uh, of Biovieja. I think most of you have heard about it on the border of Poland and uh, Belarus, our last uh, remaining wilderness area in, uh, in, in Europe, I would say. And humans and wolves have been living quite peacefully together there, I would say. But uh, things changed a little bit last winter when this particular individual, this individual wolf showed up. And that seemed to have resulted in a response of the other wolves that are living in this area. I will can tell the, about the details uh, later on. But the main result was that wolves suddenly showed up very close to the villages and actually inside the village. And there were a lot of close human wolf encounters. And that raised, of course, a lot of discussion and a lot of emotions. And I think it illustrates that once wolves and humans are getting too close to each other, things go a little bit wrong. If you look at, um, at th this picture, it's, uh, it's taking us a little bit uh, back in, in time. If you look at the history that we have had with large carnivores, we have been living at odds with each other actually since prehistorical times. You see a picture here of the Neanderthals that are attacking a brown bear. And in general, you can see that you can say that large carnivores we have regarded as competitors because often they hunt for the same prey species that we are interested in. And we've also seen them as threats to our safety. So we've had a long, we have had no, known a long history of uh, persecuting them. And actually the, the result of this centuries or even thousands of years of persecutions are actually quite large. Uh, it is nicely demonstrated here by a paper from uh, Lalibert and Ripple in, published in Bioscience that showed what happened after the European settlers arrived on the North American continent. So they showed actually what happened to the ranges of a lot of large carnivores. You see the names uh, depicted here with every uh, map. And, and you see a lot of, uh, in the last two to 300 years, and you see a lot of red on these maps, which shows that there's large range contractions. So you have them still up in the north, uh, and a lot of the areas where they used to occur, they don't occur anymore. Although, of course, there's much more uh, details about this story that also they are coming back. But in general, this is the picture. So I have problems with switching my slide. To... Ah, OK, so some kind of delays in it, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and actually, this fits pretty much to the the a global picture. If you just look on a global scale, what, what happened that a lot of large carnivores have disappeared. This is an, uh, a picture taken from uh, the paper of Ripple published in Science. Yet there are still some hotspots in, uh, in South, Southeast Asia or Central Africa where you have still rich multi-species large carnivore communities. But the areas where, where most of you, I think, come from Europe or North America are quite gray, which means that uh, no large carnivores are present in a lot of areas, although they used to occur there in the past. And you can discuss, of course, if this is an, uh, a real loss that we don't have the large carnivores anymore, because it also prevents a lot of conflicts from happening. But if you think a little bit more about the impacts that we have lost together with the loss of large carnivores, it's actually quite dramatic, I would say. This is also a, a figure taken from the same paper from a Ripple in the Science, and they show uh, what happened after these large carnivores have disappeared. I will not go into details, but actually you see that all kinds of species groups, uh, ranging from invertebrates to vertebrates, and also including plants, are changing dramatically. So some species decline, other species increase. So it shows that this, the presence of large carnivores has quite profound ecosystem effects, which are quite, uh, quite general in all, in all across the globe, you can see that. 
And they mentioned, an, uh, I would say, a, an important take-home message in this paper. The maintenance or recovery of ecologically affected densities of large carnivores is an important tool for maintaining the structure and function of diverse ecosystems. So it is worth to think about uh, getting these impacts back in your system. And another important word I would say is, the, is this one, ecologically effective densities. So it's not only about having large carnivores back, but they should have densities that are sufficient to really exert, that they are able to exert ecosystem impacts. And I think most of you are familiar with uh, a lot of work that is coming from North America, especially also the Yellowstone National Park that they intensively studied after they reintroduced wolves there. And they observed all kinds of changes in the ecosystem that uh, they link to the comeback of wolves. And I know that there's a lot of scientific debate about uh, all of these links that you see in this, uh, this figure. But I think in general, it is quite clear that uh, wolves and large carnivores in general can have clear impacts on their prey species. So that refers to density mediated effects. By killing them, they influence their numbers. But also a very important component of their presence is behaviorally mediated effects. The fact that predators are there in an area changes the behavior of the main prey species. And both these density mediated effects and behaviorally mediated effects indirectly influence what happens to woody plants. Um, and as a result, species that are connected to uh, 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 certain type of habitats, they are also indirectly influenced. Another pathway, which is an important one, is that uh, the apex predator has an influence on smaller sized uh, carnivores, uh, coyotes, for example, and in this way also indirectly influence prey species that are regulated or influenced by these intermediate sized uh, carnivores. So I would say in this context, if you think about the current recolonization of large carnivores that we observe in Europe, we should, in my eyes, uh, cherish uh, this. So probably are aware of it. This is a, a figure taken from Chapron, published in Science. We have four large carnivore species, wolverine, uh, European lynx, brown bear, and uh, wolf. And you can add to that actually also the golden jackal more and more. And actually what you see in the picture is the dark orange areas are the areas with, with, which had an, uh, a permanent occurrence of these species, and the light orange colors indicate an, an infrequent uh, occurrence. So actually what they showed in this picture is that most of these species, of all of these species, are extending their ranges. And uh, for most of these species, it also means that their population sizes are increasing. And the wolf is actually a species which is quite uh, successful in doing so. Sorry for the Dutch uh, language that you see here in the figure. So the Bioviesia village is, uh, is over here on the Polish uh, Belarusian border. And we are inside the areas where wolves have actually always been present. There have only been very short periods where wolves were, were absent. And we are producing nowadays the wolves that have settled in the western part of Poland. And actually, this process is happening quite, uh, quite fast. There's a nice paper from Sabine Novak and Robert Mislajek uh, that showed that in a period of about 11 years, uh, the wolves settled in western Poland, whereas they were absent before this period. Uh, within this period, more than 30 packs settled there, 140 wolves, they estimated. And if you go further west in Germany, the first reproduction of wolves occurred there in the year 2000. And in the year 2020, they had 59 packs and more than uh, close to 500 wolves. And even in crazy countries where I come from myself, the Netherlands, uh, you had in, uh, what is it, two years ago, uh, you had the first reproduction of wolves. So they really managed to establish in this country. They have at the moment one pack and one established pair. So about 10 wolves are living there at the moment and they expect that there will be much more. And I refer to this as a crazy country because it's an, a small country with a very high uh, human population density, one of the highest, I think, in uh, Europe, maybe even of, of the world, and also with huge impacts of, 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 uh, of, of humans on, on the landscape. But even there, wolves are able to adjust and apparently settle there for the moment. Together with some um, several co-authors, we reviewed actually what that means if you have large carnivores settling in human dominated system, especially if you think about the ecosystem impacts that they can exert. So if you think about a wolf affecting its main prey species, both in density or behavior, and indirectly maybe having an influence on uh, patterns of vegetation or uh, the influence of herbivores on the vegetation, you can in these kind of European systems never forget about 
the profound human effects that you have occurring everywhere. So therefore, we, we didn't place the human in the, on, the top, on the top of the food chain, but rather in the center of the food chain, because we influence each trophic layer. We influence the number of wolves by legal or illegal uh, killing them. We have, of course, profound effects on their behavior by creating a landscape of fear ourselves that the wolf is reacting to. We have all kinds of effects on the prey species as well. Think about hunting bags that uh, determine the uh, number of uh, ungulates that often we, uh, we, we desire to have in, in certain areas. We have also clear effects on the landscape, so indirectly we also influence the numbers or population growth rates. And of course, we influence all these proce processes from the bottom by changing our, our landscapes uh, to a large extent. So if you think about the potential impacts that large carnivores can have on ecosystems, you should always take into account all these uh, put, uh, potential, the potential for indirect effects of humans on modifying these interactions. That is, I think, also what I say here. Yes, that's what I say. But anyway, if you look at European systems, there is, um, there is evidence that uh, large carnivores can exert ecosystem impacts. And I will show you some examples from studies from the Biogeja forest. Uh, most people look at the Biogeja forest as one of the last primeval wilderness areas. I think that's partly true. Part of this area is re relatively untouched, but uh, on the, still a large proportion of this area also has clear human influences with uh, hunting uh, and uh, forestry activities. So I think it still can serve as a model system of what can potentially happen in other areas in Europe as well. So we have, and that's based on uh, studies from uh, Wodek and Zievsky, uh, with, the, with the team, so it's actually before the time that I came to, the, to Biovieja. There is studies that show that actually there is evidence for density mediated effects so that the wolf can affect the number of its prey species and the main prey species in the Biovirgia forest is the is red deer. There is a relationship between the density of red deer that you measure in uh, late winter and the annual population increase. And this relationship is much steeper without predators. And that's actually based on the short periods when predators were absent from the system. So what you see is actually that the presence of large carnivores is reducing mainly the growth rate. They cannot prevent it. Still, the, dump, the, the population of deer is increasing, but there is a clear reduction of, slow of, a, a reduction of the growth rate. And they estimated that 32 to 47% um, reduction occurs in the population increase of red deer thanks to the presence of wolves. Try to go to the next one. Ah, okay. And based on the, the studies that I did together with um, my small team of, uh, of, uh, of people, is that we found also evidence for behaviorally mediated effects. So, this is so what you see in this picture is in uh, the entire Biogeja forest. So, there's an area of about 600 square kilometers. This is the Polish Belarusian border. You see here in this white gap, that's a place where no forest is, is present and there's the, the village Biovieja. So also these other gaps that you see are small uh, uh, villages. What, what we did is we based, uh, this, this is based on a very intensive uh, camera trap study where we had camera traps more than a thousand locations spread around through the forest. So we pretty much covered the entire uh, Biovieja forest landscape. And what you see based on these uh, this data is that you have clear hotspots in the landscape where activity of wolf concentrates. So you have wolves actually everywhere. There's not a single place where there is no wolf, wolves being present, but some places are more frequently being used by wolves. And if you look what this seems to uh, mean, or what this seems to, how this seems to affect the, uh, the, their main prey species, red deer, the pattern is pretty much opposite. The places with a very high wolf activity seem to be avoided by red deer. And actually female red deer, which seems to be a more sensitive class because they have uh, a higher predation pressure, seems to react stronger than the males. So we have actually, based on a number of uh, papers, and I will not go into detail because it's not really the topic of my, uh, of my presentation, we found evidence that you have these, next to these density mediated effects, also behaviorally mediated effects, both on a landscape scale, we see that Prey species seem to use the landscape differently and take really into account the risk of uh, being of encountering a wolf or being predated by a wolf. And it also seems to affect the, uh, uh, the behavior of, of their prey species on a very fine scale. So they really avoid some parts of the landscape much stronger than others. And we have another set of papers that actually that shows that this 
changes in behavior in combination with changes in density has definitely consequences for patterns of browsing intensity. So the impact that the prey species, red deer, can have on uh, regenerating trees. And we found that these cascading effects seem to occur, that the, the places where you have a high activity of wolves are being avoided by red deer, or red deer show a different behavior, and that increases the chances for trees to regenerate in these areas. So some these things seem to happen there. But we also found evidence for uh, these, uh, this other pathway that, uh, that the presence of large carnivores, the wolf is important for mesocarnivores, so in our case, uh, a badger. And we have more, but we have a nice study, a recent study that showed that along this gradient that we have in the landscape, uh, parts of the forest where the high encounter rate of wolves, we see a different behavior of the badgers that are uh, there. So this, is the, this shows the probability of set use of badgers. So in these places where they have a high chance to encounter a wolf, badgers are using their sets, but to a much lower uh, frequency than in those parts of the landscape where they have a much lower uh, frequency of, of a, a much lower probability of encountering a wolf. So it seems that also the prey species of the, the, the sorry, the mesocarnivore species are reacting uh, by means of behavior to the presence of wolves and the spatial patterns that you have in, uh, in, in wolves. So this is maybe a picture that you've seen before that uh, is actually from uh, the, 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 the organizations in the Netherlands that are promoting the comeback of wolf. Uh, we can discuss about this in the end, but actually I was as a scientist always a, a little bit irritated by it because it gives a very lovely picture and it depicts a little bit the wolf as a saint. And which is, I think, perfect. Not so. There's scientific reasons to uh, to 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 show that the compact of wolf can definitely bring back maybe some of these ecosystem impacts, which would be very desirable, I think, for many ecos many ecosystem or nature reserves that we have in Europe. But I think it ignores a little bit the opposite picture that the wolf is also uh, a sinner or regarded as a sinner by many many people especially because a wolf is a highly conflict-prone species. So you have these two opposing views. And I, I feel often that there is, uh, that people choose for one of these pictures, but I, me as a scientist, I don't want to choose. I just want to hear arguments, how we can solve things and, uh, and find good arguments to, uh, to, to make a decision. But anyway, coming, coming to the conflicts of uh, wolves, so actually everywhere where wolves show up, uh, conflicts, I would say, quite quickly appear. And this is one of the first ones that often that, uh, that happens, livestock predation. And just to give you some numbers, in the European Union, you have 21,000 sheep being compensated. Uh, so farmers lost their sheep uh, due to pre uh, predation. And actually, the priority of these cases is attributed to, uh, to wolves. There's actually very large differences in, in uh, uh, across Europe with some hot, with really hot spots of these conflicts in uh, France, I would say Portugal, Greece, Croatia, and Italy, which is to a large extent also related to the way how we um, take care of our livestock, which developed in a period when predators were not there. So we have to adapt, which is in many cases very difficult, I would say. Another commonly perceived conflict is the, uh, the competition with hunters, uh, wolves, hunt often for the same species that we are interested in as, uh, as hunters. And that, uh, that often, uh, I think that often is, that is connected is that also hunting dogs might be killed. And that is especially in, uh, in a conflict, I would say, that exists in uh, Scandinavia. So numbers again, I found these numbers for Finland, 20 to 31 uh, hunting dogs being killed in a three year period. And in Sweden, an estimated number of 10 to 20 dogs per year. And again, of course, this is related to the we, how we are hunting. This is uh, often connected to, uh, special by, by, by moose dogs that are released into the forest. They locate a moose that allows the hunter to, uh, to shoot the, the moose. But of course, such a single dog in the forest uh, has very little chance if it, if it encounters a wolf pack. And then of course, there's concerns about uh, public safety. Um, wolf attacks on humans are rare. Uh, I think most of you agree on that, but I think we should also not ignore that they do occur. There is a uh, nice overview of a nice review uh, made by John Dinell uh, that showed that during the last 50 years in Europe, 21 documented attacks occurred and that concerns non-rabid uh, wolves, so wolves that did, did not, were not affected by rabies, so healthy dogs, or, sorry, healthy uh, wolves, uh, you would say. And it also includes uh, four lethal cases. 
Recently, there was a nice update. So what happened actually during the years afterwards, the, year, the period 2002-2020, which I think is especially interesting because in this period, a lot of uh, wolves recolonized uh, parts in Western Europe. If you then look at the well-documented attacks, then we're talking about 12 attacks in Europe and North America, of which two were fatal, fatal in uh, North America. And interestingly, I find is if you look at where these attacks occurred, then it's actually mainly in countries outside Western Europe. So it actually does not include the areas that are now being recolonized by, by wolves in Western Europe. Uh, of course, Canada and USA, but next to that, a lot of uh, countries mainly in Central and, uh, and a Central, Asia, Central Asia and further to the East, with the exceptions of Poland and Italy. About Italy, I cannot say something, but about Poland, I can at least say that the last few years we had four uh, well-documented bite incidents, uh, three in the east of Poland, a little bit close to Białogesia, and one in the west of Poland, but, but you have always to be very careful to judge these cases because in Poland it was clearly related to wolves being habituated to humans and actually learned that they can uh, that, that they were actually fed by humans and that uh, eventually led to uh, to accidents. But this is uh, so actually this is also how we think about it that we should run away from the wolf that the wolf poses a threat for us. But the fact is that uh, actually it's the opposite. Uh, the wolves are clearly responding to human presence and often regard us as a big threat. There's a number of papers that uh, that still show that even in densely populated areas, the main factor that determines patterns of space use or uh, breeding site selection is the presence of humans. So wolves try to avoid as much as they can still uh, human and human activity, sometimes on very fine spatial skills, but, uh, but they do. But despite this uh, avoidance that, uh, that scientific papers show, this is also something that happens. And this is a small overview that I made of a graphical overview of all kinds of cases where you have very close human wolf uh, encounters in different places in Europe. So along this recolonization front. I will not go into details, but uh, I think most of you know the stories of wolves showing up in the middle of a city center. For example, here in one of the major cities of Poland, Wuch or here in a small town in the Netherlands where a wolf was just passing the streets at night and, and people on a bike had to uh, drive around it. And of course, it's these kind of cases, they, 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 trigger a lot of the, yeah, they trigger a lot of, they get a lot of attention. And scientifically, it's a bit unclear actually what this means. It could mean that, uh, and that's an idea that you often hear, that wolves are slowly losing their fear for humans and getting closer and closer to, to humans that don't react to us anymore. The alternative explanation, which is, I think, still a very good one, is that this is simply the result of increasing wolf populations, which are occurring, which necessarily results in more wolves showing up in human-dominated areas, and also more dispersing wolves. So that's often the bold, young, dispersing wolves that do something stupid and end up in places where they should actually not be. We can leave it for the discussion in the end, but, uh, but it is an, a thing that, uh, that, is, that is happening. But I think we all agree that the return of wolves is often strongly connected to emotions. Think about farmers that lose their livestock, especially if they have special breeds to wolves, is a very emotional event. And I can uh, relate to that myself as having myself uh, uh, a special breed that I try to uh, preserve. So you see often in areas where the wolves are reappearing, for example, here in France, that it leads to big demonstrations where people really don't, they don't want to adapt anymore. They don't want to have wolves back. And as a scientist, if I just look at these numbers that I presented, uh, I could actually put all these numbers in perspective. If you think about the number of hunting dogs that is being killed, maybe it's, it's, it's actually nothing if you talk about it. And you would say, OK, we just compensate the hunters for their loss and everything is fine. But I think that is a mistake in our thinking, because the emotional damage that is created by this loss of livestock or loss of a hunting dog is much larger. And that cannot simply be compensated by uh, some money. And now, OK, I mentioned more things, but if you think about, for example, the number of people that are being killed by wolves, it is nothing compared to other mortality factors, for example, cars. So we can downgrade all these numbers that I presented. But I think it is a big mistake to do this, because uh, these, emotional, these emotional things that are connected with, uh, with, these, uh, with these numbers and these, these conflicts they can lead to a growing anti-wolf sentiments, which have a very big impact on support for wolf conservation in general. So I would say we should take these, uh, these things very seriously, despite the fact that maybe in numbers, uh, they may not mean so much. 
And another important thing I would say that these emotions that are connected to the comeback of wolves, they blur an objective view. I often see that people are driven by emotions and are not open to look at different options that we have to tackle these problems. So that's actually the main reason why, uh, why we wrote this article, so together with several co-authors, in which we try to look at different management options that exist and find really scientific-based arguments why these methods work or whether they would not work. So I will go afterwards and uh, I will tell more about it, but we will talk about, uh, we, we, we discussed the uh, population control, protection and compensation of the damage, fencing as a potential option or managing behavior of wolves and humans. So the aim of our paper was really to come with an objective science-based discussion on possible management approaches. We, have, we do not have as scientists an, any, uh, we don't favor any of these options. We just like to find arguments why one of these options would work the best. And especially, uh, we wanted to use the existing knowledge on large carnivores that exist in Europe, but also in other parts of the globe. Because I think this is something we should not forget. It's not that we are dealing with a new uh, problem. If you look across the globe, uh, and there's many places where people have found ways how to coexist with large carnivores. And in many places, they have to coexist with much more dangerous species, for example, the tiger, than the wolf that we are dealing with. And we really felt as scientists that we are not really optimally profiting from the wide knowledge that exists on how uh, we could solve uh, large kind for human conflicts. And if you talk about potential uh, management options, you should always put it in the framework of the context of the legal landscape that we have in, uh, in Europe. And actually, I'm not an, uh, a legal specialist, but therefore we had uh, this guy on board, Ari Trauborst. I think most of you uh, know him, an associate professor specialized in environmental law working at the Uver University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. And I will not go too much into detail, but you have actually two important legal instruments in Europe uh, in connection to wolves, that's the Berndt Convention and the Habitats Directive. And you have, if you look at the picture, you have quite a lot of variation in the precise legal status of wolves in different countries or even different regions. But you see a lot of dark green on the maps. So this is the areas where wolves are currently recolonizing. And especially in these dark green areas, you have the Habitats Directive uh, Annex 4. So that means the species wolf is, is indicated as an Annex 4 species, which means shortly that it is prohibited to kill wolves, to capture them, disturb them, or destruct their den sites. But it also means that exceptions are possible, but you need to meet three important criteria which is, first of all, there should be compelling reasons why you would like to kill wolves or why you would like to disturb wolves. And that could include protecting of uh, wild flora and fauna, prevention of serious livestock damage, and even public health. There should also be no satisfactory alternatives. And that's an important one. That's often what we don't think about, but we should look at different options that we have and really find good arguments why killing is the best option. And it should not have any um, effects on the favorable conservation status of the species. Okay, so that we discussed these different management options, but we always kept, uh, in the end, we also contrasted it to this legal uh, landscape that exists in Europe. So start, starting with population control, that's often the first thing that we think about uh, to solve uh, potential conflicts with uh, wolves. And also in Europe, you see that in a lot of countries, this, the debate is starting again, should we not control the populations? And in many places, of course, it is uh, legally, uh, uh, it is happening. Uh, I think uh, our, the, the people that are listening from the US can say much more about it, but the impression I got is that uh, outside national parks is also in a lot of regions a common management tool in, uh, in North America. And also Norway, Sweden, and Finland, uh, legal population control is happening, although there's a lot of controversies whether this is really in accordance with uh, European law. And uh, I think, of course, next, next to that, we should uh, think about illegal killing that can also be really comprising an important mortality factors as several studies show, for example, from Italy and Western Poland. So we, despite the fact that maybe there's no legal control, illegal control also seems to occur in many regions. And if you think about, uh, I would say the main issue that exists with uh, culling, so shooting wolves, is that it creates sourcing dynamics. And this is not really something connected to wolves. This is quite widespread uh, when it comes to population control of a lot of species. And just to, vis to visualize it, if you imagine an area where you have a continuous range of wolves, and let's say that you experience 
um, problems with livestock depredation in some of these areas, and you start removing wolves in some areas. Uh, and maybe in some areas are larger than the other ones. The main thing that actually that you do is that you create vacancies, so where, wolf, where no wolves uh, are present, and also where prey abundance is often very high. So what you do is that you start to attract wolves from the surrounding areas without population control. And especially if areas are larger, then often you even attract more wolves from the surrounding areas. And if you imagine this gray area as a country, what also often happens is that you start attracting wolves from neighboring countries, because the wolves, of course, don't see the country borders. And especially if neighboring countries have a completely different policy, it is, an, uh, it is, it is, a, it is a difficult, difficult uh, management to, uh, um, to, uh, to lead to successful results. And another one is that the individual wolves that you often attract are the dispersing young wolves from the surrounding population. And these dispersing wolves are much more likely to be involved in uh, livestock depredation events because often they operate alone, they are inexperienced, and often go for easier prey. A nice illustration of these sourcing dynamics from, from an impressive study, I would say, from, uh, uh, from Alaska uh, by Schmidt. Uh, very shortly, what they, what they did is they followed during a 22 years period the population dynamics in detail of an area where no hunting occurred uh, in the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve in Alaska. And it was surrounded by an area where population control did occur. And what you observed is that during periods when population control occurred outside this reserve, the natality rate, so how much wolves are being added to the wolf pack, increased. So the things that you do outside your reserve affects what happens inside. And actually, the wolf population inside these reserves became more uh, productive. And another example that, uh, that shows that uh, culling is not always your, uh, your solution comes from a long-term study by Krofel uh, from Slovenia. What they did there is they also experienced uh, increasing livestock depredation, and they decided to start a nationwide culling of wolves, which resulted in a 25% uh, uh, reduction of the population annually by removing five wolves per year. And what you see this fig in this figure is the gray bars indicate the number of livestock that was killed by wolves, and the black line indicates the number of wolves that is, that is being shot each year. And actually, since the start of culling, so in 1999, they did not really observe a consistent decline in their livestock depredation. So there was actually no correlation between the number of wolves that they shot in a certain year and the depredation of livestock the following year. And even if you look at some extreme events, for example, the year when they shot the highest number of wolves, the subsequent year, they also ended up with the highest depredation of livestock the next year. And in a year where they didn't shoot wolves, they actually observed a decline in their livestock depredation. So it seems to, to really indicate that it is leading to sometimes to counter uh, counterintuitive uh, patterns. And this is actually aligned with, uh, with several other studies that show this. So culling, as we often think about it, is, I would say, not an easy solution. Uh, culling is often ineffective, especially when it is surrounded by hunting-free areas. And that's a very important one. So when, it is, when there is spatial heterogeneity in the way how you start uh, your population control, then it becomes often very uh, ineffective. So it often does not really solve your wildlife conflicts, and it can, be even, it can even lead to an increase in your conflict as several studies uh, show. And if you look at uh, uh, culling as an option of population control in the European lang landscape, it's at the moment uh, quite quickly in conflict with uh, existing European legislation. And if you look from a wolf point of view, there's also several reasons uh, that culling is not uh, really desirable. It disrupts the social structure. As a result, it can downgrade the functional role that the wolf can play in an ecosystem, which often we aim to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to retrieve once the wolves are coming back. It leads to a higher proportion of dispersing individuals, which I mentioned are, often, are more often involved in livestock depredation. It, it often also reduces the genetic diversity, and especially when population levels of, of densities of wolves are, are, are low, it also it increases the chance of hybridization with dogs. And as a scientist, I have nothing against hunting. Uh, I just look at these uh, at, at the studies that uh, that show whether it's effective or not. Or not. 
But I would say that uh, it is quite clear that culling is only efficient where you're able to remove wolves completely, like we did in the past. Not that you, of course, you solve your, uh, your any conflict, or when you're able to remove the majority of wolves from larger areas. But the moment when you start doing it in a patchy manner, so remove wolves from only some parts of the areas, uh, and, and 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 part of the landscape being uh, uh, without any management of wolves, it becomes a, a very in, in, ineffective method. So protection and compensation. So I would say this is pretty much the default uh, management that we uh, nowadays have in Europe. Uh, so it's aimed at protecting the wolves, and if there's any damage, we compensate the farmer for their loss of livestock or other conflicts. And of course, this is beneficial for the wolves themselves. They can freely expand. It also maximizes their potential for ecosystem impacts. It's of course in, in accordance to European uh, nature, nature, nature legislation, I would say. Uh, but I think it stands or falls with a very effective way of protecting your livestock because wolves will show up in many areas, will start to explore them. So if you're not able to protect your livestock, your problem might only increase in the future. And that's also the reason why you have uh, now a growing amount of voices, I would say that uh, that start to state that it, this this policy might not will will not prevent wolves from increasing in numbers and also these conflicts to increase in the in the coming future. And when it comes to protecting your livestock, I will not go into details because that's a whole uh, different presentation. There's many very good manuals I would say that give a good overview of ex existing knowledge from areas where you have a lot of experience on, uh, in livestock farming in areas with, uh, with, with several large carnivores being present, for example, South Africa or North America. And you have these manuals, which are often largely based on these, uh, these existing manuals from these countries, from countries in the Netherlands. So find methods that are fitting better to the Dutch situation, or you have also excellent manuals for, uh, for the Polish situation. And I would say uh, if I um, very much uh, uh, make a general uh, conclusion what these uh, these manuals state, I would say that there's, they, they point at electric fences, guard dogs, fladere, so that is these kind of things, these, uh, these strips of uh, uh, material that are moving, and night enclosures are very effective methods in preventing livestock uh, predation. And different methods are best under different conditions. Fencing, that's often an, an option that we don't really think about, but uh, to solve our wildlife conflicts. So it really means to create a physical barrier between wildlife and humans or livestock to prevent that, uh, that there's any contact between them. Uh, although there's a very common uh, management tool, I would say, in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa to solve uh, conflicts that exist with large carnivores. So we have two options actually that you should think about. First of all, you have fencing in, which means create very large areas in which you uh, create enough living space and high enough prey densities that large carnivores can live there in sensible densities. So that really means there are very large areas with a fence around it, or you can do the opposite, fencing out. So think more about the areas where you don't want to have the wolves. So the, uh, the part of the landscape where you have concentration of livestock that you can fence to prevent that wolves uh, can enter these areas. So fencing in these large carnivores, so putting large carnivores in big reserves, it definitely has some benefits and it's actually quite a common tool, I would say, in South Africa, where they, uh, how they deal, where they have to deal with very large carnivores like lions, for example. It has some benefits. It's very effective in reducing your carnivore conflicts, simply because you lock up your carnivores, so outside there's no existing conflict anymore. It can also lead to a better protection of the large carnivores themselves, because it actually excludes also undesirable human influences, because you really separate humans from large carnivores. And for some species, it might actually be the only solution that may work in some landscapes to protect them, for example, for lions. But there's also clear downsides, uh, nicely reviewed by uh, Matt Hayward and Graham Curley. Uh, it leads to all kinds of undesirable ecological impacts. First of all, it leads to fragmented populations. You have just patches of your animals sitting in different parts of the landscape. So it needs really a strategic planning of how you want to preserve that there is still genes flow between them. And next to impacts on the large carnivores, you have also impacts on other wildlife species because you don't lock up your large carnivore, but you also lock up your prey species. So it needs a lot of careful thinking how you should design that. And if you think about the European context where we are dealing with 
highly fragmented uh, nature reserves and where our policies are often aimed at getting things better connected. Uh, I think the option of thinking about fence, fences is a very difficult one because it is really opposing the, uh, the things that we try to, uh, to, uh, to aim for in, in Europe. But fencing out large carnivores or keeping them out of the places where you are most likely to have conflicts is a, is a very effective method. There's, there are several papers that show that this is a very uh, a proven effective method, it, but it critically depends on the construction of your fence and your maintenance of your fence. I will again no, not go into details, but there are clear guidelines about how tall these fences should be and how much electrical wires you have. If you construct them properly, it, it gives a very high efficiency of keeping lives, of uh, keeping wolves or other large carnivores out of your uh, uh, out of the areas where you don't want to have them. And if you think of, again about the fragmented landscapes that we're dealing with in, in Europe, this is an example of uh, uh, the Lausitz region in Germany, where you have uh, quite an, uh, quite a population of wolves uh, living. So this is often how it looks like. You have villages, you have agricultural fields with, land, with uh, livestock, and you have uh, forested areas. Especially in these kind of landscapes, I would say that fencing out the most conflict-prone areas uh, to really keep large carnivores out is, uh, I think, a very sensible solution. It fits well to our highly fragmented landscapes, and it is really it could help to protect hotspots that we have in the landscape often where these conflicts are concentrated. Well, the last option, which I found myself the most interesting, and I think it also has, it is maybe least explored, but I think it has also really the potential for uh, much more clever thinking. Uh, management that aims at changing the behavior of wolves and also of humans to create a fine scale separation. And if I refer to the picture that I showed you from Biogeja in the beginning, the wolf showing up in the village, the moment when this happens, so when we are getting too close, then often the conflicts appear. So how can we create this separation between or maintain this separation that wolves and humans are just losing, using different parts of the landscape? Well, there's actually a, a number of techniques that you, can, uh, that you can use, which are all based on aversive conditioning. The idea is that you create an, or you want to create a negative association for a wolf to be close to humans or be in areas with a high livestock presence. And you also want to create this long lasting effect that you on the long term they avoid these places. But the big question is can we do the same like we do with our dogs? Can we teach a wolf not to be somewhere? Well, I would, would just like to refer to an interesting paper that uh, indicates something in my eyes a paper from Rossler in which they tested the effects of uh, shock collars. And I definitely do not want to promote the use of these techniques in the European context, but I think it is. Uh, important to show the results of the study in this context. So what they did is they caught wolves, they, uh, they put a radio collar on, and they also put a shock collar on, which is, uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with these things. These are just small devices that from a distance you can trigger that, uh, uh, and the wolf will, will receive a small electrical shock. I think they also used in, uh, in dog training or, uh, or, or, or dogs, keeping dogs out of certain areas. And what this study showed is that during this period, when the shocks were operating, so the moment when the wolf was uh, close to a livestock farm, it received a shock, it reduced enormously the time that these wolves spent there. But interestingly, uh, the period afterwards, so that means a period up to uh, 40 days afterwards, the wolf still remembered that in this particular part of the landscape, it should not be. There is a negative association created with being in close to livestock, uh, to, 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 life, to a farm. And the figure on the bottom, wait, that was too quick. The figure on the bottom actually shows even something more interesting. They, uh, they, they put this uh, electric, the, the shock collar on one single individual wolf. But if you look at the response of the other pack members, then it also clearly reduced the presence in these uh, areas close to the farm. So by teaching one pack member something, you actually taught the entire pack something. And I think that's very interesting. And there's actually a range of different, um, um, uh, I call it, uh, uh, the cues being tested that could create such a negative association for wolves or other large carnivores with being in certain places or prevent livestock predation. For example, chemicals that they, uh, that they use to treat carcasses to teach a wolf that it is not nice to eat a sheep because afterwards it gets uh, 
uh, a very bad feeling. For example, it induces uh, vomiting. There's all kinds of devices that you can find, especially on the North American market, that create disruptive stimuli, uh, sort of based on sound, uh, loud uh, li uh, lights or reflections or bad smells that are being emitted once the large carnivore shows up. And there are several studies that show that uh, these often create very strong immediate responses for coyotes or wolves, for example. But the big question is whether also on the long-term habituation may not occur. There's a beautiful review of SWIFT published in two, the year 2000 that showed actually that all these devices, they have relatively mixed results. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But I think an important message that is, uh, uh, is shown in two recent papers, uh, one by Eklund uh, in uh, scientific reports and also in, uh, uh, by Trebus in Frontiers in Ecology and, and the Environment, it shows that there's actually very little uh, good scientific studies that really test the effectiveness of these devices. So, so there's very poor scientific testing, which means that often these studies do not really follow a proper scientific uh, design. So it's often difficult to really uh, conclude whether these devices really work and if they really reduce uh, the, the, the presence of large carnivores compared to a control situation. And also often the big question is whether how, of how long lasting these effects are. But I think the example from uh, the shock collars, and I think most of you uh, probably will agree with me, that wolves are definitely not stupid animals. They are very smart. And I would say there is definitely much more potential in exploring these methods in ways how we can teach uh, this animal to do something or maybe of actually not to do something. This is maybe, or I used that for a Polish uh, uh, presentation, maybe not so relevant as also in, 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 bear, in bear management, these kind of devices are also very common, uh, bear flares, marine flares, rubber bullets to create uh, also a negative association with humans, but it's mainly aimed at uh, very close encounters to prevent these very close encounters. But even this, I think, would be in some cases for wolf management, sensible options to think about to prevent very close human-wolf interactions. But if you think about ways how we could scare uh, wolves or large carnivores in general, I think we should not forget that we have already a very important tool at hand, and that is our voice. There is a uh, beautiful set of uh, studies conducted by this uh, by a Canadian research group that says using these devices, a camera trap connected to a sensor, so it is being triggered once an animal shows up, and is connected to a speaker, a sound device. So what they show with uh, with a range of studies, and I just show you one example here of connected to Puma. Puma they the moment when these large carnivores, the puma, hears different sounds, frog, small dog, a large dog, or a human, it leads to a response. And quite general is that the response towards hearing human sounds is really very strong. It creates the strongest fear effects in almost all species, in a range of species, in a range of ecosystems. So in this case, 80% uh, of the pumas left their freshly killed uh, deer once they heard humans. And it doesn't mean that these are loud sounds, that it's not screaming humans or no, no gunshots. It's just slowly, calmly uh, speaking the humans. So I think this indicates that actually there is a lot of potential, uh, I would say, and it is definitely worth to explore how we can use these human fear effects also in wolf management to prevent wolves from being somewhere. And I think if you think about uh, wolf management and ways how to prevent conflict, uh, a very crucial one that uh, wherever, where all our thinking should start is uh, if there is enough uh, wild prey. There's a very clear relationship between the availability of wild prey and how much livestock depredation occurs. Nicely demonstrated here by a paper from Sidorovic, uh, an area in Belarus. What they showed during a period when the ungulate abundance declined, and that's all because intensified hunting, they observed a much higher uh, proportion of dogs being killed, of a number of dogs being killed uh, in, this, in this region. They also observed that the livestock predation went up, and they also observed actually much, frequent, much more frequently wolves showing up in villages. So it really indicates that the starting point of all our thinking should be make sure that we have a rich wild ungulate community. And these are the species that we have in the Biogesha forest. So we have quite a rich community of potential prey. Uh, European bison, moose, red deer, wild boar, roe deer. But if you think about a European context, uh, often these two big species are missing. 
Moose, of course, occurs a lot in Scandinavia, but uh, many, many more areas in the temperate zone, uh, moose could also be present or used to be present. But if you think about red deer uh, and wild boar in many areas in the Netherlands and Germany, and there's much more, I think, we prevent this species from settling because they are involved in agricultural conflicts. So despite the fact that often we have quite high uh, densities of, uh, of prey, often our prey communities are quite impoverished and it's only composed of only a few species. And I think that's a, a bad starting point when you think about conflicts. Okay, you can think about teaching the wolf something, but I think uh, uh, we should just as much teach humans uh, something. There's a nice paper from uh, uh, Pentariani uh, published in scientific reports that reviewed during a period of uh, what is it, about 60 years more than 700 documented large carnivore attacks on people, and that includes puma, but also includes wolves, uh, black bear, brown bear, polar bear. And actually, they showed that in half of the cases of these human attacks, human behavior is the main thing that triggered actually the attack. And there's all kind of risk increasing behavior, for example, ch leaving children unattended in the forest, uh, dog presence or dogs unleashed uh, when you are in areas with large carnivores that seem to be responsible for, it, uh, for the attack that occurred. There's also several studies and also this one that show that food conditioning and habituation is, a ve is another very uh, risk enhancing behavior. So I think we should really think about that our behavior is a very important one in, uh, in managing also in, uh, these uh, human wolf conflicts. And especially in areas that are nowadays being recolonized by wolves, I would say that people really need to learn again what it means to live together with, uh, with wolves. With my background from the Netherlands, I exper experienced myself uh, that a lot of people are simply not aware how to behave. And the internet is full of these kind of pictures of uh, people hugging or kissing wolves, and I have nothing against it. But it also gives, in, uh, in my eyes, a completely wrong picture, because the wolf is not a cuddly animal. It is a species that evolved for thousands of years, 10,000 of years, to hunt big prey, so they have big teeth, big claws. And I would say a large carnivore or a wolf is not dangerous, but it definitely uh, deserves our respect. So we should teach people again how to behave in areas where wolves are present. Uh, do not approach them, do not feed them, do not, not be there at night, keep your dogs on the leash, but also be, maybe give the positive message that uh, enjoy the species, but keep your distance and pay your respect. So to summarize my, uh, my, my talk, I hope it was not uh, too dense of information. Uh, I, sh I showed you in the beginning that uh, there's definitely ecological impacts that wolves can exert also in European systems. And I think uh, uh, we should in general be very happy with the comeback of large carnivores. But once conflicts appear and we think about solutions, then we often start to think about population control. Although in some cases, definitely this may work, but we have to keep in mind that it often does not solve the conflict, especially if you start to have a lot of variation in your uh, population control uh, in different areas. And it is definitely uh, very quickly and in clear conflict with European legislation, current European legislation. We should much better profit the existing knowledge that exists on uh, protecting our livestock. There's a lot of knowledge out there with good scientific uh, um, uh, good scientific studies that show that a lot of methods work. But I think it depends very much on the context, which method is the best. So maybe in some places, these big guarding, guarding dogs may help. In other places, locking up your animals at night is a very effective method. Whereas in other places, especially on a finer scale, uh, electric fences is a proven effective method. I would say in managing behavior of wolves and humans, that it's definitely something that needs to be explored much better. I think there's a lot to gain. The wolf is an clever animal, we can definitely learn this species something, but just as much we should uh, learn humans also to behave. And the main thing that I've, I would say we should try to enhance is this mutual avoidance. Make sure that if wolves start to live in human dominated landscapes, they, wait a second, sorry. When wolves start to show up in a human dominated landscape, we, we, we create this mutual uh, avoidance. And it stands or falls, I would say, uh, how effective all these methods work 
with creating a rich wild prey basis. So we should ensure that wolves concentrate on wild prey rather than domestic prey. So I, uh, I, I end with, uh, with, this, uh, with the slide that I showed you in the beginning. I would say that the last thousands of years, uh, we should have become much more clever. So we should think about more options that we have at hand than only population control. Although in some cases it may work, I think we have much more knowledge now to look at different options. So this is what we say in Poland at the end of the talk. Dziękuję za uwaga. Thanks for your attention. I hope that uh, it made some sense to you. What I think. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and summarizing talk about the situation uh, of wolves in Europe. Uh, we will now stop the recording and summarize the um, discussion in the next book magazine. So um, if you're interested in that, just let me know, comment below, or um, just give me, give me an email and I will send you the results or the, let's, let's say, the most important topics of our following discussion. Thank you so much for joining in and uh, probably see you next time with our interdisciplinary talks in winter time. Yeah. Goodbye. By the way, did you wonder what kind of strange wolf you see in the back? Well, because that's not a wolf, that's a jackal.